Good evening. Welcome to the 2011 Fedelson Lectures, uh, which I'm pleased to say this year are being held in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography. The lectures are sponsored primarily by the G. Younger Vettelson Foundation and the Graduate School of Oceanography. Our colleagues in the URI Coastal Institute and the URI Honors Program and the College of Arts and Sciences, including its uh, recently named Harrington School of Communication and Media and Rhode Island Sea Grant, have all been very gracious in co-sponsoring the lectures this year. In honor of the 50th anniversary, we're focused on the state of our oceans. And in a minute, I'm going to introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker. But before I do that, I want to meet my uh, state required obligations and point out to you your nearest exits, which are behind you, the doors you came in. And uh, I don't see anyone up in the balcony, but they will be to the sides and behind you. The restrooms are uniquely configured in Edwards Auditorium now. There are uh, unisex restrooms on this floor, and there are restrooms for men and women on the floor below, should you need them. I'd like to, as always, ask that you turn off your cell phones and uh, refrain from smoking or disturbing your neighbors. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce David Farmer, who's the Dean of the Graduate School of Oceanography. David is a very respected physical oceanographer and a member of the Royal Society, which is not something you often hear about scientists in North America. So with that, I'd like to ask David to come up here and introduce our speaker. Thank you. Good evening. I'm proud to introduce Dr. Margaret Leinen to you this evening as an alumna of uh, a Graduate School of Oceanography. She was a professor and dean of a Graduate School of Oceanography as well as vice provost for marine and environmental programs at the university here. And she is a well-known researcher in paleo-oceanography, paleoclimatology, ocean biogeochemistry, and she has studied ocean sediments and their relationships to uh, global biogeochemical cycles and the history of the Earth's climate. She also served as Assistant Director for Geosciences of the National Science Foundation, which funds much of the academic research in ocean, atmospheric, and earth science in the United States and directed the National Science Foundation's environmental research and education efforts, which coordinated the portfolio of environmental programs for that agency. Dr. Leinen served as chair of the US Global Change Program, the interagency program responsible for coordinating federal climate change scientific research. She also served as co-chair of the National Science and Technology Council's Joint Subcommittee on Ocean Science and Technology, of which she had a leadership role in the development of the Ocean Research Priorities Plan and as the lead of the U.S. delegation to the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. Dr. Leinen was also previously the president of the Climate Response Fund, a nonprofit organization focused on facilitating discussion of issues concerning, concerning climate engineering. She also served as chief science officer of CLIMOS Incorporated, a startup company focused on attracting funding for ocean experimentation in carbon sequestration. She is past president of the Oceanography Society, the outgoing chair of the Atmospheric and Hydrospheric Sciences section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Geological Society of America. She currently serves on the board of directors of the American Geophysical Union the Board of the New National Council for Science and the Environment, the Board of the National Ecological Observatory Network, and the University of Rhode Island Foundation Executive Board, and she's on the uh, uh, 
Advisory Council for the Graduate School of Oceanography. The network and the University of Rhode Island Executive Foundation Board and really many other boards and organizations too numerous to mention. Dr. Leinen began work as the first Associate Provost for Marine and Environmental Initiatives of Florida Atlantic University in February 2011. Actually, she starts her job on Monday, uh, where she will also serve as Executive Director of the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. The uh, Florida Atlantic University has marine and environmental programs at all seven of its campuses serving over 28,000 students. She is responsible for coordination of initiatives across the campuses, and in addition, she is responsible for the leadership of the university's oceanographic program and the management of the Harbor Branch campus. I think you can see why we are proud to count her as one of our own. Ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to introduce you to Dr. Margaret Leinen. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, it's wonderful to be back here on the stage where 31 years ago I received my PhD. And also wonderful to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Uh, it's a very, very special place in my heart, and uh, I love coming back. So today I have posed uh, a very provocative question for you. Should we engineer the climate? And there might be many answers to that, depending on your point of view. Uh, for example, uh, there are many who believe that climate is not changing, or that it's not changing as a result of our activities, uh, in which case any kind of engineering of the, the climate is unnecessary. Others look at this from the standpoint of uh, a conviction that climate is changing, but also an abhorrence of the idea of human intervention uh, to offset what has already been human intervention in the climate. And that certainly would be the viewpoint of environmental organizations like Greenpeace and a new consortium of organizations called Hands Off Mother Earth, which oppose any, any kind of climate engineering or even research on climate engineering. And then more and more uh, today, we're seeing a viewpoint expressed by the scientific community that is very leery of the idea, very much concerned about doing research on it, but still saying we're not getting anywhere with climate negotiations, and we might need to do this. And that includes the UK Royal Society, of which uh, David is a member, uh, their equivalent of the National Academy of Science. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page with what we consider to be climate engineering, the American Meteorological Society, American Geophysical Union, and the Royal Society have defined climate engineering as having really four key aspects. The first is that it's deliberate, a deliberate modification. So our inadvertent modification of climate through use of fossil fuels is not considered geoengineering or climate engineering because it was not done for that purpose. It also includes a modification of the climate system, second, on a large scale. So if I paint my roof white to deflect away sunlight, it's not climate engineering. But if there was a, a federal policy that every roof in the US had to be white, that would be considered climate engineering. And the fourth is the intent that it's done to avoid dangerous impacts of climate change. So that's the, those are the constraints on what we talk about when we talk about climate engineering. So I want to now go back a bit in my own history with this topic. 
Um, as David said, I got my degree here. I uh, studied the carbon cycle in the ocean, the history of the inter ocean's interaction with climate. I did a lot of work at sea in which we tried to understand what controlled the primary productivity of the oceans, the phytoplankton, the grass of the sea. And one of the people who was a real icon for me in this field was John Martin, another URI graduate, who was a leader in identifying the role of, the, of uh, nutrients other than nitrogen and phosphorus in controlling uh, in controlling the productivity of the ocean. And he identified the role of iron, very small amounts of iron, which is extremely insoluble in seawater. And so in the ocean far from land, iron is so very scarce that it's actually a trace nutrient for, um, for phytoplankton growth. And since phytoplankton takes CO2 out of the ocean, out of the surface water, and then that re-equilibrates with the atmosphere, growing phytoplankton removes CO2 from the atmosphere. And about or mid-1980s, John, in a very offhand uh, comment, which was very typical of John, uh, said in a talk at Woods Hole Oceanographic, if you give me half a tanker of iron, I'll give you an ice age. And what he meant by that was that he could stimulate phytoplankton growth, it would take CO2 out of the atmosphere, and that would reduce that, that uh, enhanced greenhouse effect. I was really, uh, and, and John talked about uh, the idea of perhaps purposefully uh, engineering climate through iron fertilization. And I was really uh, very, very deeply concerned about that idea. I had seen what the oceans looked like uh, up close when there were huge phytoplankton blooms. And that uh, blue area is out in the equatorial Pacific. The, the cloudy area is not clouds. That's um, uh, phytoplankton in the water. That, and the idea of modifying the ocean so much that you would generate these kinds of blooms seemed not only unnatural to me, but also something that really was not something we should be thinking about. And of course, I was very aware of a lot of times when we've tinkered with, uh, with ecosystems uh, with well-meaning intent, but have, re have had results that were unexpected. My thinking about this started to change in 2006 while I was at National Science Foundation. And Paul Crutzen, who was one of the three scientists who won the Nobel Prize for understanding what caused the ozone hole and the interactions, uh, he's a stratospheric chemist, started talking about the need to do research on techniques that might be used to engineer the climate. And he particularly was interested in the technique of uh, adding um, aerosols to the stratosphere, and I'll talk a little bit more about it. And his motivation was not that he thought that this was something that we understood totally, that we should go out and do, but he was looking far into the future, and he was concerned about our lack of ability to get emis uh, CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gas emissions under control. And he said, if we don't do this, and we don't do it very quickly, we're going to be in a position where the impacts of climate change will become more and more severe, and we might not be able to step back from them. So he felt that we needed to engage in a research program, probably 10, 20 years of research, to understand whether any of these techniques could be used. He tried to publish a paper on this in a journal called Climatic Change. The editor of the journal was another friend of mine, Stephen Schneider, and uh, I started hearing about the reviews of this paper. Um, all of the scientists to whom it was sent for review said it shouldn't be published, not because the science was bad, but because they were afraid of the concept. 
They didn't think it was appropriate for us to even talk about doing research on this. Stephen didn't know what to do. He has a Nobel Prize winner who uh, nobody made any comments about the science in the paper, but have said, don't go there. We can't think about it. So he approached uh, another friend, Ralph Cicerone, who at the time was the provost at UC Irvine. He's now the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and said, what do I do with this? And Ralph said, publish it as an editorial. So you haven't, uh, you've taken the advice of the uh, reviewers, but you still get it out there. And in the meantime, Ralph wrote his own editorial comment, essentially chastising the scientific community for not being willing to engage in reasoned scientific discussion about something like this. That was 2000, early 2006. Um, at the time, one, one other thing before I go on. Um, David mentioned that I was the vice chair of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. And at that, uh, in 2006, it was the year that the fourth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was supposed to be reviewed by governments. So I was in charge of making sure that the U.S. government reviewed um, the three reports of the fourth assessment. The first of those reports was on the detection and attribution of climate change. And it said, in very clear terms, this science is decided. We do know that climate is changing, and we're, we have at a 95% certainty um, the, the evidence that it is a result of our land use change and our use of fossil fuels. The second of the reports talked about the impacts of this change and said that now we had been looking at the time series of impacts on climate uh, for almost 25 years and that the data now clearly showed that this, these greenhouse gases were affecting ecosystems, the physical climate and the biological ecosystems. And the third of the reports is about mitigation. What are we doing? And what tools do we have in our quiver to approach this? And the thing that stunned me was that that volume was essentially the same as it had been in the first assessment back in the uh, almost 20 years earlier. And it was then that I started to realize what Paul was so up concerned about that the tools that we were developing and the consensus that was there was not keeping pace with the, the impacts that we saw. So now I'd like to spend a little bit of time telling you uh, about some of those impacts and why the scientific community has become so alarmed that they would engage in research on geoengineering. I'd like to tell you just uh, a sprinkling of some of the ideas that they wish to explore, and then to talk a little bit about what the implications of doing that kind of research are uh, for ethics, governance, risk, public opinion. So when I grew up, I grew up in Joliet, Illinois, uh, right here. And uh, I was always a gardener. Um, I, uh, I didn't have a big garden, but I had, uh, I had a little garden and, you know, you would get the seed packets and the back of the seed packet told you when it was safe to plant, how long the growing season was, and so forth. And much of that was based on hardiness zone maps that had been developed uh, in the past. And this is a 1940 map of the hardiness zones uh, of the U.S. So Joliet was in zone four. Uh, here's Rhode Island in the middle of zone five. And uh, one of the coldest places up here in northern Minnesota was firmly in zone two. By 1960, when I went to high school, uh, things had begun to change. The hardiness zone for my city was now in zone five much warmer. Rhode Island was still in zone six. And 
uh, northern Minnesota was now on the border between zone two and three. The higher the number, the warmer the winters. The last two maps, 1990 and 2006, show really dramatic changes, mostly in the mid midsection of the, the country. Uh, Joliet has moved into zone six. Uh, northern Minnesota is firmly in three. And even Rhode Island has started to, uh, buried under there, it's actually moved into zone seven. As I say to climate skeptics, plants don't do research. They aren't funded by agencies or private groups who have a perspective on climate. They don't uh, publish papers for which they have a reputation to defend. They just grow in response to the climate. And the impacts of climate change are already affecting agriculture in the US by changing the, not only the patterns of, of, um, of growth, but also the growing season. And if, we, if you were familiar with, and many of you probably are, uh, the western coniferous forests of this continent, you would know that, uh, northern, that um, the pine forests of uh, Canada, especially Alberta, uh, the pine forests of, of Colorado have been under an assault by uh, the pine bark beetle. In most, it used to be that in winter, uh, the length of winter was long enough to kill off a very large proportion of the pine bark beetle population. So only a few beetles made it through the winter to be able to grow during the summer. That's not true anymore. And the pine bark beetle um, bores tunnels in the pine and injects uh, material which prevents sap from rising. So the trees are actually drying out and dying. And all of those uh, the, the right one doesn't show up very well, but those are essentially brown pine trees. More than 33 million acres of pine uh, affected in Canada, several million acres in the western U.S. It's the largest die-off of, of, of uh, forest that's used for the lumber industry in the history of the continent. Dramatic changes in the Arctic summer sea ice superimposed on a, a long history from 1978. To, well, I guess that's a, it's a long history in terms of satellite observation. It's a short history uh, for anybody else. But uh, over uh, 30 years of satellite observation show a, a strong decrease in the extent of summer sea ice in the Arctic, going from minimums in the, in, uh, the 70s um, that covered most of the Arctic to only half of the Arctic being covered. And it's not just the extent of the ice, it's the fact that the blue Arctic uh, absorbs more solar radiation, it warms up, and it has a feedback effect uh, that oceanographers are very concerned about. So th those are some of the very obvious changes that don't rely on statistical analyses of, of data to see the changes happening. The IPCC projects the, the uh, emissions that we will uh, that we'll be emitting in the, in the future to try to form scenarios of what the future might be. And this is uh, their map of a world without emissions reductions. They call it the business as usual scenario. We don't do anything about emissions, and uh, developing countries grow at the same pace that they have over the last approximately 30 years. And it shows, uh, these are in degrees centigrade, all these red colors are three and a half to four and a half degrees centigrade. So changes of on the order of seven, eight degrees Fahrenheit. And the poles have projected increases of six and a half to seven and a half degrees, 11, 12 degrees Fahrenheit. These are very, very substantial changes projected for the future. Updates to, since the 2007 IPCC report have highlighted that the climate changes that we see are happening 
earlier than predicted even by the, the 2007 assessment. They're more intense than was expected by that assessment, and they're happening faster. The trajectory of global fossil fuel emissions that was generated that, to look at these um, scenarios looked at a whole range of different emission scenarios from we all start uh, conserving energy, uh, some of these blue curves, to business as usual, which is this yellow one, to a red one, um, which is not only do we not do anything about fossil fuel emissions, but the developing countries start using fossil fuels more rapidly than, than present. Or than, uh, the, remember, this was generated in about 2004 and 5 for the 2007 uh, assessment. We're actually above the business as usual track on a scenario that, that many skeptics said was invented by the IPCC just to scare people, that we would never be on that trajectory. And yet that's exactly where we find ourselves. Now, again, one of the reasons, uh, that, that's all scary enough, but uh, when you project out the kinds of changes that were being proposed at Copenhagen, uh, unsuccessfully, and say what would happen if they were all adopted and they were all 100% adhered to. We would end the century with about 700 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. We currently have about 390 ppm. So almost doubling CO2. Uh, compared to business as usual, which would be about 950. I don't say that as a way of castigating the negotiators, but as a way of showing you how difficult this problem is. It really is an issue of having to deal with a change in the entire energy economy of the globe. It took us well over 100 years to get here, and it's very difficult to turn that around. So all of our uh, data show that even when emissions are stabilized at 90% below present levels at 2050, the two degrees centigrade threshold, which the negotiators used as a sort of a cap, we shouldn't go beyond two degrees, um, even when emissions are stabilized, we will pass that. And in, if we're, we're to avoid that, something will happen, have to happen. This particular author says we'll have to capture CO2 directly from the atmosphere. If this weren't enough uh, to call it, sound the alarm, uh, ocean acidification is what's been referred to as global warming's evil twin, or global change's evil twin. The oceans take up 28% of the CO2 that we put into the atmosphere every year, and they have an, it has an enormous impact on the oceans. And one of the primary impacts is that it lowers the pH of surface waters in the ocean. CO2 is a weak acid, it dissolves in the ocean, and it generates, um, and, and it lowers the pH, it makes it more acidic. We already know that it's affecting uh, corals and other, um, and other uh, organisms that make skeletal material out of carbonate. Right now, in Oregon, shell fisheries for uh, mussels and oysters rely on a prediction of upwelling, upwelling of low pH water uh, that's made in advance for them by NOAA so that they can pull the oyster sets or pull the mussel um, during times of low pH. It's already affecting shellfish aquaculture in, in uh, Oregon. NOAA has, uh, has run a number of simulations about what coral reefs will look like uh, under the combined threats of both warming and lowered, uh, lowered pH from increased CO2. Um, a, a more scientific or graphical uh, picture of that uh, would be a, a map like this that uh, shows us where coral reefs can grow 
Um, and it's based on the amount of uh, one of the ions that they're dependent on, the carbonate ion. When you put more CO2 into the water, the carbonate ion concentration decreases. So before the Industrial Revolution, all of these areas that are red are adequate or optimal for uh, coral reefs. Uh, by 1995, you saw that area decrease. By 2040, just with the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere, uh, we go into the entire tropics being only marginal for coral reefs. And with additional CO2, uh, by the end of the century, we have uh, almost all of the oceans um, too low in carbonate ion concentration for corals. But many oceanographers are even more concerned about organisms that are not corals. One of the bases of the food chain, especially at high latitude, are marine, small microscopic marine snails that make their shells out of calcium carbonate. They're a very important part of the food chain in marine ecosystems, especially uh, high latitude food systems. And we already are beginning to see impacts on pteropods being unable to adequately calcify their shells. Likewise, uh, other organisms that are, are phytoplankton, uh, like coccoliths, which make these little, these are microscopic shells of those organisms, uh, we see losing their ability to calcify. So the question then is, and these are the, the concerns that are leading scientists who, like me, 10 to 15 years ago were extremely negative about the idea of, of climate engineering to say, do we have tools that should be explored, not deployed, but explored and looked at for, uh, for dealing with this? So. That, that's the, the scary picture. What are some of the tools uh, that are being suggested? There are two primary means of intervening in climate or climate engineering. One of them is modifying the absorption of solar radiation by the atmosphere, essentially reflecting sunlight away from the atmosphere. That would cool the atmosphere. It wouldn't do anything about the CO2 that's in the atmosphere or any that we put into the atmosphere in the future, but it would cool the planet. The second is to ad address the CO2 directly by modifying elements of the carbon cycle to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So the idea of modifying the albedo or re the reflectance of the planet was the idea that Paul Crutzen said we should look into. And this idea comes from what happens with explosive volcanoes. This is Mount St. Helens, uh, but an even more potent example was what happened with Mount Pinatubo in the early 1990s. Explosions like this inject huge quantities of sulfur dioxide into the, the lower stratosphere. They nucleate aerosols, especially sulfate, that have uh, wavelengths of reflectivity that reflect sunlight back into space. And so after volcanic eruptions like this, the Earth cools uh, for several years. Uh, the top graph here shows that with respect to Mount Pinatubo. So this is 1990 to 1995. And uh, this is the time of the Pinatubo eruption. And the, the dark curve is the northern hemisphere uh, average temperature, and the dotted line is the global average temperature. And it's plotted against what the average was before Pinatubo. And you see that after Pinatubo, both globally and in the northern hemisphere, the, the temperature actually decreased. This is in centigrade, so it's about 0.7 to 0.8 degrees centigrade, so over a degree Fahrenheit. And that temperature stayed low for a couple of years. And that was because of the sulfate aerosol in the stratosphere. We know from looking at records of other explosive volcanic eruptions uh, that this is also the case 
for other eruptions, uh, Krakatoa, Santa Maria, Agung, El, El Chicon. And so this is a diagram that just has years after the eruption, and the line is the time of the eruption. And this was the global average temperature before and the average global, te average, uh, average global temperature afterward. So in each case, these eruptions result in cooling for a couple of years. So the idea behind the sulfate aerosol technique is that you would put small amounts, you don't even have to have nearly as much as goes into a volcanic eruption, small amounts of sulfur into the stratosphere uh, to reflect sunlight away. So this is really thought of as something that you could do in a hurry. The effect is very uh, pronounced and it's very quick. Another idea uh, dealing with albedo is modifying the low-level marine clouds. Uh, clouds reflect about 50% of the sunlight uh, away that reaches them. And we know that, that if you can enhance the, uh, the number of water droplets in the clouds, they become brighter and they reflect more sunlight away. This black and white image is an image of, uh, of the ocean. And each of these little lines that you see is actually the track of a ship. And the stack gases coming out of, of the uh, stack of the ship from the burning of fossil fuel uh, put water vapor primarily, uh, some aerosols and some salt into the atmosphere. It nucleates water droplets and it actually makes the clouds a little brighter. So in the early 90s, John Latham um, from uh, uh, University of Edinburgh suggested that you might be able to uh, use ships that did not burn fossil fuel, uh, a, a flatten rotor ship, to inject seawater to the height of a few hundred feet in the atmosphere and generate brighter clouds. Uh, he looked at this as a, a better solution than the stratospheric aerosols because as soon as you quit, the, the clouds start dissipating. And so the, the effect wouldn't last for two years. It lasts for a few days. So in other words, you could turn it off more easily. On the carbon side, again, neither of those techniques, and there are a host of other ideas for enhancing reflectivity of the atmosphere, none of those do anything about the CO2 that's already in the atmosphere. So uh, other ideas are focused on direct capture of CO2 from the atmosphere by using various absorption resins or, uh, or strong bases. Uh, all of these require uh, energy, uh, but the, the amount of CO2 that's taken out is greater than the amount that's put in by whatever energy source you have. Um, but they also require you to be able, you captured that CO2 and you have to do something with it. So all of these require some form of, of carbon sequestration. Uh, most of them propose doing that in deep underground aquifers. And there are a host of, of issues associated with that. Uh, another technique that depends on the, uh, the uh, on stimulating uh, things on the biological side uh, is the use of biochar. Biochar is uh, finely divided charcoal that's generated from pyrolyzing organic material, essentially burning it in the absence of oxygen. And we know that in the past, uh, especially in uh, Amazonia, uh, during, uh, during the uh, uh, Inca period and the Aztec period uh, that, that uh, the Indians dug uh, uh, biochar into the, into the um, ground, into the soil to enhance water retention and enhance retention of, uh, of nutrients. So they actually uh, geoengineered their area to enhance fertility. So the idea is that you might do this on a much larger scale. And then we come to the idea that John Martin had, which depends on this association between uh, iron uh, in the ocean and its productivity. So the idea would be to put iron into seawater. It's not iron filings. It's very soluble uh, iron sulfate to try to stimulate 
the phytoplankton growth, have that move through the biological cycle. And one of the big questions is how much of that carbon would you sequester for a long time into deep water, getting it away from the atmosphere? There have been about 13 smaller scale experiments looking at this. All of them stimulated phytoplankton growth, uh, but only four of the experiments even tried to measure how much carbon was sequestered. They were really interested in the biology of the process and the role of iron, not in looking at this as a geoengineering technique. And uh, this is a, a satellite image, and the colors on it are false color images of the concentration of chlorophyll in surface waters. This is Alaska, the west coast of Canada, and uh, west coast of the US. And this was an iron fertilization experiment. It actually, you could actually see the chlorophyll in it from space. So I haven't told you all of the ideas, but it will give you a sense of them. And all, most of them are based on some sort of natural analog. Uh, but others are, are, like direct air capture, are totally synthetic. All, if you looked at any one of them, uh, you probably wouldn't be able to solve the problem. Obviously, with solar radiation management, you don't do anything about CO2. But the, the point is uh, we, that we don't even know enough about them to understand whether they would be useful. So we sort of come back to that, that sense of alarm from, uh, understandable alarm from the environmental community saying, you know, haven't we, got an, haven't we got enough problems without considering this as well? Uh, some of this uh, also reverberates into the idea of how would you use this? How would uh, what would be the point of geoengineering? And I put in red the, the, the use that really nobody wants to see, which is uh, just to do this to avoid reducing emissions. Let us go on business as usual, but we won't feel the impacts. Most people talk about it in terms of uh, adjusting to those negative impacts that are already out there, uh, reducing us to some Pre, some des, more desirable state of CO2 concentration, or ameliorating a specific impact of climate change, like a loss of the summer Arctic sea ice, uh, or maybe something that was in our back pocket in case of a climate catastrophe, like a failure of the West Antarctic ice sheet, which would result in uh, a fairly rapid increase in sea level of, uh, of feet. Others have suggested that maybe this is something that we could do a little bit of while we were making this transition to a different energy economy to try to keep us below some uh, dangerous level of CO2 in the atmosphere. But even the purpose for which you would use it uh, is something that, that engenders a lot of debate. Uh, recognize or you know realistic debate, understandable debate, and it would also you know how you would use this um, these tools would depend on what you were trying to do. Then in March of 2009, Foreign Affairs published a very provocative article uh, by a group of social scientists, and they highlighted the fact that. All of the scientists talking about stratospheric aerosols had noticed and had, had brought to our attention the fact that that could be done very inexpensively, basically a billion dollars to do it. It's a lot of money, but it's within the reach of many states, um, uh, nation states. It's also within the reach of um, any individual, you know, a very wealthy individual who thought that they were doing something uh, to help out. And they raised the question of geoengineering being considered uh, not only as uh, a do-gooder sense like this without any international consensus, but also um, being used as a threat um, to reduce emissions to uh, something that, uh, uh, you know, we're going to cool the Arctic uh, 
uh, whether you like it or not. And this article really changed everything in terms of the way that governments who were very, very reluctant to look at geoengineering research started thinking about it. Essentially, they were, they were now faced with the idea that someone is going to think about this as an option. Uh, other countries, rogue individuals. So what are we going to do about it? If we don't understand it, we're really at risk. And this has really changed the debate about climate engineering research. So um, there are lots of technical questions that we would have about this. Um, and you know, scientists in our, our focus on, on looking at this as a problem to be solved could certainly come up with a long list of things that we could de design experiments to look at. Does it really work? How efficiently does it work? Can it, could it be scaled up? Uh, could it de be deployed rapidly? Could it be stopped rapidly? Uh, what are the known impacts? What, what, you know, what would you have to measure? Uh, what happens if, if, if we did solar radiation management where we were ignoring the CO2, just cooling ourselves down, and anything happened that forced us to stop? Uh, you know, we, we didn't have the, uh, uh, you know, we didn't have the financial resources to do it anymore. Or there were, there was a breakdown of society. The rebound effect uh, from all of that CO2 which was accumulating in the atmosphere would be an even more rapid uh, increase in temperature. Uh, so that really would be a climate catastrophe. It's uh, uh, a Faustian bargain, if you will. I think that, that those, those questions about technology are in the realm of science and so forth. But the real questions that are being posed now about this are not the science questions. They're the questions about the ethics of doing it, the risks of doing it. Who would govern this? Uh, who would make decisions about it? And where does public opinion come into this? So this is the uh, logo of uh, hands off Mother Earth. You can barely see that there, hands off Mother Earth. Our home is not a laboratory. And I, I, these are real questions. They're important questions. And they're ones that are really the focus of the debate about climate engineering research right now. Uh, the ethics debate. Um, for a long time, we've talked about, ethic, uh, about the problem that this might be a moral hazard. In other words, um, you know, if this is a life preserver that we know we have, will we be less inclined to uh, get on with the hard work of uh, decreasing emissions? Or is it a slippery slope? If we do the research, do we become more accustomed to the idea and it seems less abhorrent to us? Uh, we don't have the appropriate skepticism about it. Uh, I think that the Foreign Affairs article really turned these ethical debates on their ear, uh, saying there's another factor to be uh, included here. It's not a question of whether um, this would motivate people to uh, stop doing, uh, stop emitting, or it wouldn't motivate people to stop emitting. There's a danger that someone might actually uh, start doing it. And there are other countries in which this research is going on. Not a lot of it, but uh, countries like Russia, China, UK are all funding research on geoengineering. Another ethics question that isn't um, sort of set in abeyance by those concerns are the questions of the ethics of experimentation. Uh, the Nuremberg Code uh, formed uh, during the, the examination of Nazi war crimes uh, and during the Nuremberg trials really focused on the ethics of, of experimentation and informed consent. And it's the basis of the idea that to do uh, experimentation on human subjects that you have to have their permission. Uh, in the, the wake of the Tuskegee 
syphilis scandal. Um, the then US, U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare uh, undertook a, a study of experimental ethics with human subjects that resulted in the Belmont Report. It articulated three principles for experimentation. The principle of respect, another uh, that's the informed consent principle. The principle of beneficence, which said that the research had to be done for the maximum benefit. Uh, in other words, you, you can engage in research uh, just for scientific curiosity. It has, to, it has to have a direct benefit. And the third, the principle of justice, which focuses on who gets that benefit. And this was the one that was so violated uh, by the Tuskegee uh, syphilis experiments. So the benefits, the, 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 the burdens fell primarily on people who had no, had no uh, idea what was going on while the benefits flowed to others. And many people have talked about this in terms of geoengineering, uh, the principle of respect that there would have to be an agreement, a global agreement, walking into this with knowledge that um, that experimentation was going to take place. The principle of beneficence that the benefits that were explored would have to accrue broadly, uh, globally, uh, not just to one country. In other words, not just solving my environmental problem to my satisfaction. And the principle of justice that in doing either research or thinking about deployment, that uh, that the benefits could not accrue only to the wealthy. Uh, there's a vigorous debate that's gone on about risk. Uh, we're trying to learn from nuclear power, irradiated food, recombinant DNA research, uh, a host of other um, risk uh, experimentation that's taken place. Um, recombinant DNA was as controversial an issue in the 70s as climate engineering is today. Michael Crichton wrote a book about that, too. He wrote a book about, uh, about climate recently. Uh, Nobel Prize winners were right in the forefront of the argument. That's um, James Watson, who won the Nobel Prize for his work on, on DNA. Uh, the scientific community at that time, approached this by going off by itself uh, at a very uh, historic conference at the Silomar Conference Center in California. Uh, and the conference was on recombinant DNA. And it sought to identify how you could contain the risks of experiments. Uh, and that's Paul Berg, who uh, subsequently won the Nobel Prize for his research on recombinant DNA. He was the the chair of the meeting. Uh, recently, uh, the, the nonprofit that I was part of uh, sponsored uh, an analogous conference for climate intervention, climate engineering. But the difference was that we no longer think that the scientific community itself can go off and decide the rules on this. So the conference also included environmental organizations, organizations that specialize in international treaties, governance, uh, the uh, uh, risk management, uh, international legal frames. And they identified a set of principles in addition to the, the some of them resonate with those uh, Belmont principles, but there are additional principles for research, that the purpose must be to promote the collective be benefit, that responsibility and liability must be established before research can take place, that it must be open and cooperative rather than uh, funded in camera and done by, by uh, groups that don't interact that the research must undergo iterative evaluation and assessment, much like climate research does today, and that public involvement and consent is going to be required. And those are high standards. Uh, I'm not aware of any other field of science in which the scientific community has said a priori before engaging in research 
that they would uh, adhere to these kinds of standards before any research went on. This isn't the end of, of the dialogue. I think it's just the beginning of the dialogue. There are a great many other questions of governance, international law, and so forth. But I think that what I want to leave you with is the sense of a scientific community which is growing more and more alarmed about climate change, ocean acidification going unchecked, which now feels compelled to argue for research that as recently as 15 years ago, it would have been abhorred, it would, it would have found abhorrent uh, to engage in. And a scientific community which has openly engaged the public to talk about these issues and to, to try to achieve some sort of consensus before research takes place. So should we engineer the climate? Uh, we have no idea whether we could at this point. We have no idea what the impacts are. We have no idea what the social impacts would be. How would we come to a decision to engineer the climate? Um, our ability, our, our social structures and our governance frames, uh, the way that we look at things, are not designed for these kinds of global decisions. The closest we've come so far has been the Montreal Protocol uh, involving the ozone hole. My own feeling is that geoengineering research will not take place until governments are convinced that there is a, a growing climate impact that they see as being potentially of equal uh, danger as the social, the cultural uh, issues associated with thinking about engineering the climate. In UK, obviously, they have already passed that point and they're engaged in research. Um, but we can't look at this as just, you know, that the US gets to decide or that we get to decide based on our own frame, our own thinking about this, because it really comes to the heart of our relationship with the environment. And even in this country, we have such a broad diversity of feelings about what our relationship is to the environment, what our responsibility is, if we have a responsibility. And if you look globally, the cultural association between humans and the environment is very different based on history, based on culture, based on religious and philosophical thought. Uh, so I think that this is one of the most demanding questions that we will be asked to confront as a scientific community. And believe me, because it's being, uh, the questions are being asked at such a high level that we as society will have to think about this. And so as we consider this Petri dish that we live on with its finite resources and changing resources, we're being asked to confront the idea of in less than 100 years, moving from a global society which is at the mercy of climate to one which has inadvertently changed climate to one which is having to deal with the idea of purposefully changing climate. And I think that that is one of the most difficult and fundamental issues that we may have to confront in the future. Thank you. So we have time for uh, a few questions and answers. As a, as a general reminder, we follow a standard procedure where 
If you have a question, you raise your hand and someone will bring a microphone to you. Do we have people with microphones? Yes. Okay. And uh, again, please bear in mind to be civil at all times and, and to keep yourself to questions so our speaker can provide us with answers. Thank you. Hi. Um, my question is about uh, John Martin's research. Mm -hmm. And you said that some studies have been done about this. And I was wondering what the results were. Do you know anything about this? Certainly. Um, John Martin's own research was really focused on the question of, does iron limit phytoplankton growth ocean productivity in areas far from shore. And uh, through a set of cruises and experiments over a period of about 10 years, he demonstrated that to the satisfaction of the scientific community. I don't think there's anyone in uh, the scientific community that doesn't agree that, that over large areas of the open ocean in what we call high high nutrient, low chlorophyll regions, that it's iron that regulates productivity. He argued very passionately for those uh, uh, open ocean experiments and, uh, and was successful in that. Uh, as I said, there have been 13 experiments. All of them resulted, they were all, uh, iron was put into areas that had low concentrations of iron. And they all resulted in large phytoplankton blooms. Um, but they, they were really designed to answer the question, does iron limit phytoplankton growth? And what is it about the iron? And what are the other you know, uh, details of that? And does it limit it in the North Pacific? And does it limit it in the South Pacific? And does it limit it here and there? Um, they were not designed to look at whether you could use that as a geoengineering tool. So there are, um, there are, there is a large group, an international group of scientists who want to propose uh, a large experiment. When I say large, I mean maybe 50 by 50 kilometers, which sounds, uh, when you're, especially when you're from Rhode Island, really sounds huge. But uh, in the open ocean, far from shore, you could certainly do that without creating uh, a lasting negative impact on, on the ecosystem. And uh, actually, scientists at URI are part of that consortium of, of scientists that are ready to propose that experiment. Uh, there are certainly some people that would be sensitive enough that 700 ppm would, would be a problem for them. For most of us, it would not be. Um, we don't know a lot about the impact of high CO2 concentrations on uh, uh, on our own metabolism, on our own human health. Those experiments, there have been primarily studies that looked at disease vectors and were those uh, disease organisms um, enhanced by high concentrations of CO2. But as I said, the, the issue is when you put that together with other stresses, like if you put that together with um, with current rates of pollution, or you put that together with other, uh, with, with high concentrations of hormones in our drinking water, do those multiple stressors then result in, in uh, putting us at risk? Uh, 
and uh, the National Institutes of Environmental Health are starting to look at some of those kinds of interactions. I think that really for uh, up until the last maybe three or four years, people didn't want to think about CO2 going that high. They would talk about, well, maybe we would get to 400 or 450. And, you know, quite frankly, with the, with the amount of effort that's necessary to turn around our fossil fuel use, there, I don't think there's a responsible scientist that says that we won't be beyond 450. By the, certainly by the end of the century, even with, uh, with strong efforts. Um, I, I do believe in technology. I think that, uh, that we're going to find other energy sources that will be cheaper and that won't be dependent on fossil fuel. The question is when and how much CO2 we'll put into the atmosphere before we round that curve or turn that, that curve over. That's a, a very good question. All right, uh, first off, I'd like to ask, carbon dioxide is to, is uh, what plants breathe, am I correct? It's what? Carbon dioxide is what plants breathe, right? It's like oxygen, oxygen to us, am I correct? They, they use a CO2, combine it with water, and make their organic material. Okay, so wouldn't it only make sense that if there's more CO2 in the air that there'd be more vegetation? Uh, there is uh, a fertilization effect, if you will, for plants. Um, it, uh, to the best of our knowledge, based on big experiments in the open air that are where they put extra CO2 uh, into the, the environment, as well as laboratory experiments, that uh, when you, if you double CO2 relative to their their standard, which was about 375 parts per million, uh, that, that uh, at the beginning there is a fertilization effect. But after a while, it starts being a negative effect. And the reason is that, that for terrestrial plants, they start closing their stoma because they can't, uh, they can't use all of the CO2. And so by closing the stoma, they start closing down that effect, and they don't use as much of it. There are also uh, a number of uh, very complex interactions that have to do with the rest of the metabolism of plants uh, that, that clearly show that uh, the fertilization effect does not go beyond uh, a certain amou amount. And then at the same time, you have the, the negative components of the, the additional CO2 uh, essentially, the, uh, in oceans, the acidification on land, primarily the climate impact. So what you're saying is that, that would essentially have effectively no scrubbing effect at all on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, it's complicated, but they're, first they, they, would, they would increase their fertility uh, and ha probably have increased their fertility somewhat. But we would have to stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere in order for that fertility to be actually be scrubbing. We're putting so much in that the small fertilization effect doesn't offset it at all. Thank you. Is that Stan? <laughs> it's nice to see you again. Uh, you're absolutely right, and that's why when I, I stopped and I said, you know, scientists can generate, we, we know how to generate research experiments for this part. The, the issues of governance are substantial. 
and uh, the the issues of institution, uh, the, the right framing for institutions are substantial. And I think that that the you know the the impact of doing something like this in terms of our thinking about our responsibility is very substantial as well. It's interesting that I said that the U.S. didn't have a, a climate change or a, a climate engineering research program, uh, but um, two of the, th the, the National Science Foundation has funded three grants for geoengineering. One of them was modeling, so, you know, not putting anything into the atmosphere. The other two were both in social science. One was on the ethics of geoengineering, and the other one was governance frames, and whether there were, uh, whether we could learn from governance challenges with Montreal Protocol. So uh, it's very well recognized that those are monumental challenges that we would have to look at in addition to the science and engineering. You're absolutely right. Well, that's about five questions. Um, the the Silmar principles call for open, cooperative, international development of research agendas, and that, the, from the standpoint of of deciding what research needs to take place. Uh, the international community is already starting to do that. And the U.S. plays pretty well in that sandbox, you know, in terms of, um, because it's scientist to scientist. The, the second part of the question was, you know, are, will other people essentially do this and, and we, you know, we're not uh, good partners and therefore uh, where are we? I think that that's an important question for when you get to the point that um, there's enough known that the countries start agitating for this. My own feeling is that, that um, and, and that's why I highlighted that in, in UK, they already believe that there are strong enough climate impacts that they should be doing this research. That's clearly not it, it, and it's a formal program. That's not the case in the U.S. For the U.S. to get to that point, I think that there has to be a consensus that can stand in the face of political uh, challenge that says that there is uh, a big enough impact to consider this. And uh, that's a really difficult issue. Right now, um, none of the agencies are willing, to, even if they're interested in funding the research, they're not willing to propose a program of research because they don't think it would, they, they think that there'd be too much political pushback. Um, so that sort of says that in this country, it's going to take some recognition of impact. And that kind of comes to what, you know, where is the message and why has the message not been effective if, uh, you know, I, I believe, again, not on the basis of tree rings or something else, but on the basis of things that you can see, uh, like plant growth, um, uh, growing season life and so forth, that it's already there. Um, and I think that we have, uh, my own feeling is that, that a lot of this has been unsuccessful, first of all, because we focused on something other than the well-being of individuals. So a lot of the environmental community has focused on biodiversity. You know, I, I told people this noon that I thought that it was 
uh, a real shame that the polar bear had been made the poster child for climate change because while people in this community might feel that that was a catastrophe, um, I don't, there are a lot of communities in the U.S. for which, you know, they, they don't know the polar bear, they've never seen a polar bear. The polar bear is an, it's a nice stuffed toy that, that their child may play with, but it doesn't really, you know, judged against their own income or their own ability to have a job or their own um, standard of living, you know, it, it, it just doesn't win. And so by framing it in terms that, that really don't bring home the implications to you and me and everybody in this room, I think we really have lost. The second thing is that I think that we've cast this in a sense that's sort of a scolding, negative, you know, you can't have your SUV anymore, or you can't use all that fossil fuel to cool your house to whatever temperature you cool it to in the summer. Uh, instead, you know, the, 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 our, the, the real challenge is, you know, how do we develop an energy alternative that doesn't, isn't based on fossil fuel that's cheap enough to make it stupid to burn fossil fuel instead? And I don't think that that's an impossible goal. Uh, and I think that somewhere along the way, the, these arguments just were framed in ways that they don't work for most of, most of the population of the country, not only that, the, the politicians as well. So I'm sorry, a little speech there, but um, I, I think that's the situation. Please join me in thanking Dr. Leinen for her little speech. It was a pleasure to have her back, and I want to remind you all to come back in two weeks on March 1st when we will have our next speaker, Ed Laws. Who's? Oh, it's all the way at the end. Oh.